morning. Good morning. On behalf of Wells Davis Young, Neil, Post 209, the American Legion, Unit 209, the American Legion Auxiliary, and Squadron 209, and the Sons of the American Legion, I welcome you to Orphanville's annual Memorial Day service and observance. First District Vice Commander Carl Stubingen will be your master ceremony. This whole situation was a little unusual, so we've changed the program considerably from what we normally do, but we hope that uh, the meeting, the observance will be meaningful for you. Former President Ronald Reagan once observed that we are forever indebted to those who have given their lives that we might be free. The United States, the freedom for which it stands, the freedom for which they died, must endure and profit. Their lives remind us that freedom is not brought cheaply, it has a cost, it imposes a burden. And just as they whom we commemorate were willing to sacrifice, so too must we, in a less final, less heroic way, be willing to give of ourselves. From Lexington and Concord, Kandahar and Ramadi, nearly 45 million Americans have answered our country's call service and over a million of the sons of God have made that cause with their lives. To those who have worn the cloth of our nation, it is of utmost importance that the sacrifices made by our brothers and sisters be revered and remembered, that their stories be told. Our speaker this morning was to be Wisconsin American Legion Department Vice Commander Paul Bessler, but because of current restrictions, he was unable to join us this morning. So I will bring a Memorial Day message to you. Every crisis has new heroes. During 9-11 attacks, they were the first responders running into burning and crumbling buildings as others ran out. Now, during the coronavirus pandemic, the most visible heroes are the healthcare professionals who are saving others, risking their own lives while doing so. These heroes have much in common with the people that we honor today, America's fallen veterans. They are men and women who have sacrificed their own lives so that others could live. They are both elite and ordinary. They are elite in the sense of character. Giving your lives so others could live is the ultimate definition of selfless. And they are ordinary and the fact that they represent the diverse fabric of our country. They are rich, poor, black, white, male, female. They come from every ethnicity and background. In short, they look like any one of us. As we celebrate this selfless and untiring performances of the healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic, it brings to mind the military medics, doctors, and nurses who sacrificed their lives while treating others on the battlefield. One such hero was pharmacist mate third class Jack Williams. The Navy Reserve Corpsman was only 20 years old when he landed on Iwo Jima 75 years ago. On March 3, 1945, James Naughton, the Marine in Williams unit, was wounded by a grenade. While under intense enemy fire, Williams dragged Naughton to a shallow depression and treated his wounds. Williams used his own body as a screen and was shot four times, yet he continued. After he treated Naughton, Williams dressed his own wounds and proceeded to treat another Marine despite his own immense pain. While heading to the rear, he was hit by a sniper's bullet and killed. For his actions, Petty Officer Williams was awarded the Medal of Honor. We also remember Army veterans like Lieutenant Sharon Lane. According to her biographer, Phil Bilger, Lieutenant Lane threw herself into her work as a nurse. While serving in Colorado, she requested a transfer to Vietnam. There at least you're busy 12 hours a day, six or seven days a week, she said, in a 1968 letter to her parents. Her dedication was obvious, even as she treated enemy Viet Cong soldiers who would return the favor by kicking, cursing, and spitting at their American captors. In the early morning of June 8, 1969, Sharon's turn to the Soviet-built rocket 
struck the hospital. Lieutenant Sharon A. Lane was killed in action at the age of 25. Now, if she were still here, her skills as a nurse might still be benefiting us during the current crisis. But not all of the heroes working during the COVID-19 pandemic are in the healthcare industry. Grocers, first responders, delivery workers, drive through restaurant employees are just a few of the many people that we rely on to provide vital services for society while risking their own safety. The military also has heroes in every occupational field. Truck drivers, cooks, administrative clerks have all paid the ultimate price. At sea, on land, or in the air, military service requires great risk. Roy Knight Jr. was a pilot with the United States Air Force. On May 19, 1967, he was shot down while attacking a target on the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos. He was posthumously promoted to Colonel. Last year, a joint team from the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency discovered and later identified Colonel Knight's remains. When his remains arrived at Dallas's Love Field, a crowd gathered to witness the dignified transfer of the flag draped casket from the Southwest, Southwest Airlines jet into the receptive arms of the military honor guard. One observer reported that the entire crowd fell silent. The Southwest flight was piloted by another Air Force veteran, Colonel Knight's son, Brian. Brian Knight was only five years old when he said goodbye to his father as the elder knight left for Vietnam. This is not yet another legacy that those heroes leave behind. A legacy that includes their sons, daughters, grieving parents, grandparents, and friends. Their heroic acts are sometimes performed to protect those with whom they serve. Corporal Jason Dunham was a squad leader with the 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines in Iraq. On April 14, 2004, his squad approached the Toyota Land Cruiser. After his squad discovered AK-47s in the vehicle, the enemy insurgent exited and engaged in hand-to-hand -hand fighting with the unit. The driver dropped a grenade. To save his fellow Marines, Corporal Dunham made the ultimate sacrifice, threw himself on the grenade, and tried to use his helmet to shield the blast. Severely wounded by the grenade's fragments, Corporal Dunham was taken off life support eight days later. Corporal Dunham died so other Marines could live. He too was awarded the Medal of Honor for gallantry. Approximately one million men and women of the U.S. military have lost their lives in defense of our nation since the founding of this great republic. Not all have died from enemy fire. Some have died from disease that have too often festered around war zones. Oftentimes, death from disease and accidents outnumbers casualties caused by enemy weapons. During the Spanish-American War, 60 soldiers of the all-black 24th Infantry Regiment volunteered to serve as nurses. 36 of them would later die of yellow fever or malaria. A generation later, flu would kill nearly 16,000 U.S. soldiers in France during World War I. Another 30,000 American service members died in stateside camps. Now, these men and women could have isolated themselves in the safety of their homes, but they knew they had an important job to do, a mission to accomplish. They were all on a mission to serve. And let us also not forget the 22 veterans a day who take their own lives, often alone, and desolate. The war came home with them, and they were not able to escape its demons. This Memorial Day, as we continue to honor those who fell in battle, let us also pause to remember those who have sacrificed their lives while serving others. May God bless them, and may God bless you for remembering them here today. Thank you. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the sinking of the USS F.C. Davis, DE-136, in the North Atlantic. 
in the closing days of the war in the European theater. 115 sailors went down with the ship. The Davis has the distinction of being the last American warship sunk in the Atlantic during World War II. Three officers and 79 men survived. Because the few remaining survivors are all in their late 90s, the sons and daughters of those surviving crew members have formed an association to keep the memory of that disaster alive in the minds of Americans. In 1980, Post 209, at the behest of Davis survivor and Post member Bill Reamer, hosted a reunion of the crew members. We ended up hosting several reunions. When the Berlin Wall fell in 1991, Post 209 hosted a reunion that included survivors of the German U-boat 546, the craft that launched the torpedo that sunk the Davis. This would prove to be the last reunion as the members were becoming too old to travel. Members of this association contacted the Post several weeks ago and wanted to make a contribution to the Post to make this year's remembrance a little more meaningful. Douglas E. Minert, the son of senior surviving officer Ensign Robert E. Minert, composed a tribute to the men of the Davis, and I would like to read that to you now. As I read the tribute, a Post 209 Honor Guard will place a wreath at the foot of the flag that was erected by reunion members to pay tribute to their lost shipmates. In the spring of any year, it is impossible not to feel hope. The hope of renewal and recovery, of the rebirth of life, and the everlasting presence of an abiding spirit that makes us who we are as Americans, who we are as a people. In the spring of 1945, that hope and presence was stronger than perhaps at any time in history, for the world was about to emerge from a world war that had threatened the very essence of humanity. For almost five years, Americans had done what Americans have always done, answered the call. For every professional soldier, sailor, and airman, there were thousands of ordinary men and women who stepped up at a time when there was no one to spare, nobody else to do the job. On the home front, women and families sacrificed endlessly. Food, clothing, medical supplies, raw materials. Nothing was too much to ask for for the cause of freedom. In some cases, though, the ask was simply too much. The sufferings of the Second World War were the sufferings of people, families, families like our own, with dreams of future rooted in tradition and heritage, the legacy of our ancestors, and the inescapable bonds of generations of love and home. For those who answered the call as civil citizens, the pain of separation was tempered by the hope, victory, and coming home. In most cases, that was to be. For so many families, the separation was permanent. And the loss of those left an unfilled void for the rest of their lives. Such was the case for the families of the 115 men lost at sea, the last Allied warship to be sunk in the Battle of the Atlantic, destroyer escort 136, USS Frederick C. Davis. On the 24th of April, 1945, the ship was in the cold waters of the North Atlantic. They were part of a hunter-killer group of destroyer escorts and pocket carriers chasing down the remnants of Hitler's U-boats. At approximately 9 a.m., they got a contact halfway through their run to intercept the enemy. DE-136 was torpedoed. In just minutes, the ship split in two and settled into the frigid, shark-infested waters as officers and men desperately tried to rescue one another and survive. In the end, only three officers and 79 men were saved. One letter of condolence to her survivor's family began with this sentiment. In these days, when we have so much cause to be thankful for the war in the Atlantic, the last season, feeling of especially deep sorrow that I write concerning your son, lost in the torpedo wing of the USS Frederick C. Davis. So much to be thankful for, even at a time of great tragedy. In our grief and respect for those lost, let us remember that the sacrifices gave each of us much to be thankful for today. Every day is a gift. In that spirit, 
I'd like to share the closing of that same letter. The scene is the burial at sea for officers and crew the day following the sinking. April 25th dawned a magnificent spring day. Bright blue water, clear sky, fresh wind, and a shining sun. All in contrast to the gray, desolate weather we had been handling. It was a beautiful, natural setting that one could hope to find. At 10 o'clock, your husband folded in a new flag of the country which he so well served was carried slowly to the rail by a guard of honor in full dress blues. The captain, every man and officer who could be spared from running the ship, every survivor who could make it, all were present to pay their last respects. While we listened with bowed heads, the chaplain quietly read prayers and the burial service. Then, while the bugle played taps, the bodies of our friends were committed to the sea for which so long to them had been a second home. In the midst of tragedy, there was hope. A magnificent spring day, bright blue water, clear sky, fresh wind, and shining sun. This is the stuff of eternal optimism of America. To see such hope in the presence of such despair speaks volumes about the character of which the people who fought and won that war, most especially those who did not come home. This spring, the 75th anniversary of that great tragedy, we honor the memory and the service of those lost. Gallant men on a little ship in the cold waters of the North Atlantic are far from home. Let us honor their memory by treasuring today and every day they gave us through the sacrifices they made. I'll proceed with the rededication of the Memorial Park. In the name of Kenneth Smiley Wells, Frederick Curtis Davis, Glenn Harry Young, and Benjamin Harold Neal, we rededicate this Memorial Park to the memory of those departed comrades who offered their lives that justice, freedom, and democracy might survive to be the victorious ideals of the peoples of the world. The lives of those who have made the supreme sacrifice are glorious before us. Their deeds are an inspiration. May their service to America inspire us to continue to fight for the ideals for which they gave all. We rededicate this memorial park to them and to all those who served their country through military service. With it, we dedicate this post to the faithful service of our country and to the preservation of the memories of those who died that liberty might live. Ludwig Abrahamson, Albert A. Amundsen, Charles A. Andresen, William Arneson, Marlon W. Barr, Robert H. Bartlett, Joseph M. Bastion, Ralph L. Bennett, Lawrence E. Bird, Julius O. Byrne, William F. Blau, Robert G. Brunswold, Donald G. Birchfield, Stanley L. Burtness, Vincent Burtness, William M. Cardwell, Earl G. Carver, Roland S. Champney, Dale Christofferson, Clayton H. Clare, Robert M. Clark, Douglas G. Cooper, Virgil W. Cowan, Wilmer Cox, 
Herman C. Dahlman, James V. Dahlman, Frederick C. Davis, Donald Day Sr., Curtis L. Dean, Clifford D. Dorr, Harley E. Draves, Robert Eckstein, Harold A. Edwards, Jerry E. Gale, Edward A. Engen, Walter W. Engelbretson, Howard R. Fish, Clifford M. Flack, Randall Fletcher, Eugene E. Fry, Lawrence H. Funk, Walter Dan Galusha, Gordon W. G Gordon R. Gard, Roger W. Gard, George W. Gardner, Olaf M. Gilbertson, Otis D. Gooch, Elmer H. Gazda, G. O. Gunderson. Robert G. Gunderson, Theodore P. Gunderson, Elwood J. Hahn, Frank C. Hamilton, Gerhard Hansen, Lawrence A. Hansen, Duane H. Hartman, Oscar Haugen, Kenneth A. Hawley, Merlin S. Heggie, Louis Heggie, Oscar Heggie, Merwood Helgeson, Charles R. Heskar, Robert A. Heskar, Stanley Heskar, Alvin L. Heyerdahl, Stanton R. Heyerdahl, Ogden A. Hillison, Sr. Alfred O. Huff. Richard L. Hoyne. Harry B. Holden. Paul C. Howe. Lyle G. Jacobs. Donald J. Jensen. John Lewis Jensen. Arthur O. Johnson, Gaylor Johnson, Glenville P. Johnson, Sr., Harold Johnson, Orville C. Johnson, Palmer Johnson, Paul C. Johnson, Final W. Jorgensen, Anthony Kenkowski, Lawrence J. Kazbiski, Jack M. Kettle, Peter J. Classy, William C. Klitzman, Sr., Glenn C. Knudsen, Charles M. Landis, Sr., Lambert J. Landing, Darwin C. Lee, Jake Lightning. James R. Long, Victor L. Long, Clifford R. Lorenzen, William J. Los, Brian R. Malmquist, Raymond A. Martin, Sr., Carol K. Martin, Irvin L. Martin, Matthewson Family Veterans, Robert R. McCartney, Dr. E. Ralph McNair, Rudolph F. Meyer, Menno Menengau, Douglas B. Mercer, Robert K. Myers, Vernon A. Miller, Harold E. Moffat, Robert K. Moore, 
Robert W. Munchow, Benjamin H. Neal, Arland Nelson, Paul Neuenschwander, Charles F. Nolan, Ronald J. Norby, Stanley K. Nordang, Sr., Thomas J. Nordang, Drexel M. Norman, Victor D. Norman, Vincent A. Strike, Leon R. Olin, Laverne Olmstead, Roy A. Olson, Selmer M. Onsgard, Alfred P. O'Toole, Eugene J. Pakanowski, Russell B. Palms, Jr., Harold J. Paulson, Myron E. Paulson, Elwin L. Petty, Russell M. Pino, Donald E. Plater, George C. Plater, Michael J. Pankowskis, Olaf Presbron, Dennis Raybach, William B. Reamer, Jr., Willard E. Reesey, Charles F. Risch, David L. Runnis, Lester W. Runnis, Norval C. Sagan, Ralph S. Sagan, Maurice C. Satrain, David J. Shea, Christian W. Schmidt, Donald L. Schmidt, Charles T. Schroeder, Leland E. Schroeder, Kenneth R. Schultz, Gilbert C. Schuler, Elmer Scott, F. Leroy Scott, Ronald H. Scott, Dennis R. Shoemaker, Lowell A. Shumway, George R. Smith, Jr., Glenn E. Straw, Arthur D. Strzok, Barbara P. Stuvenger, Bruce A. Stuvenger, Charles G. Stuvenger, Charles L. Stuving, Gilmer S. Stuving, Louis J. Spam, Albert C. Taylor, Upton C. Taylor, Sr., Elliot L. Taves, David N. Thompson, Sr., Newell J. Thompson, T. F. Tink Torson, Carl A. Tostenson, George A. Tinker, Frank C. Tippett, Ralph L. Updike, the crew members of the United States ship Davis, Peter L. Vanderjack, Carl S. Wagley, Irvin G. Welkos, Kenneth S. Wells, Glenn K. White, Claire T. Williams, Henry W. Williams, Sr., William Wood, Louis Randall Woodman, John Warden, Glenn H. Young, Norman A. Zweifel, Stephen R. Zimmerman, their number is 191. At this time, please rise.
for the playing of taps. This concludes our abbreviated Memorial Day observance.